So, I, so today is Easter Sunday, right? And, and we, uh, last Sunday, we celebrated what's called Palm Sunday. Was anybody here or go to a church where they had palm branches? Aren't those cool? You can use them like swords and fight and everything. I just always loved Palm Sunday. And, and you know what we do with all those palms? We brought all those palms and laid them at the altar. You know what we do with them? We keep them for a year and dry them out and they become really brittle. And then almost a year from now, next Ash Wednesday, we burn them and we use all the ashes from those palm leaves and we use them for Ash Wednesday when we put the mark of the cross in the ashes on our forehead. You remember that service? And, and, uh, and, we, use them for, and we begin the whole Lenten season again next year with those palm branches that we used last Sunday. Hi. You can sit if you want. And... Uh, and we did something else on Ash Wednesday. On Ash Wednesday, we buried in this box that's supposed to look like a tomb, we buried a word and said, we're not going to speak it at all during Lent until Easter morning. Does anybody know what that word is? What, what's that word? Hallelujah, right. And you see that banner up there, all those hands? Some of those hands might be your hands on that sign. The, the people in the back can probably read it, but uh, it's, it spells out the word Hallelujah. So we don't speak it at all during Lent, and then we get to say Alleluia on Easter morning and bring it out from this box and and put it up in our sanctuary. So today we get to finally say that word again. Will you help me in shouting that word to the Lord? Alleluia. One, two, three. Alleluia. Alleluia. Now that's pretty good, but I know you are a lot louder than that because I've heard you at times. So can you help me? And maybe your brothers and sisters can help too. One, two, three. Yeah, praise the Lord. Thank you for coming up. You can go back to your seat. Do you know where, do you know where your seat was? Is it down this way? I'll go with you. Do you see where it is? Maybe mom or dad could raise their hand. Oh, there. Right. There's mom. There you go. Sisters and brothers, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The story we hear with Mary Magdalene in it, the story is our story. We know Mary's grief, don't we? She was such a good person. She didn't deserve this. How could God let him die? We know Mary's grief, don't we? But at least Mary has her grief that she can hold on to. At least she can cling to that life that has been lived. She can uh, cling to all of the memories and cherish what was. She can build her memorials or her monument in his honor. She can try to keep his legacy alive that he might live on with us. At least Mary has a place to go to where there's something of him that remains. But now they've stolen his body? And she doesn't even have that anymore? How could God let this happen? How could God let him die and now let his body be taken? Which expresses, it seems to me, a feeling of, I don't know, maybe betrayal. Could that be what Mary feels toward God, betrayed? I mean, if it is, who could blame her, right? You let him die. You let his body be taken. And it's not just that he was such a good person, though he was. And it's not just that he was so dear to her heart or didn't deserve this. All of that may be true. But he was also the hope for Israel. He was also the help for all. He was supposed to be the Messiah, God's own son. How could God let this happen? How could God let him die and let us down like that? And it doesn't seem that it even enters her imagination or that she can fathom for a moment that there could be any other explanation. She knows what the empty tomb means. Her certainty about life and about death, that death is the end, means that the body must have been taken. Is she so assured of her certainties and maybe even feeling betrayed by God or disillusioned, that she 
can't even possibly entertain that there might be another answer to this? That maybe, just maybe, God is at work in all of this evil to bring about good? That maybe God is at work in all of this death to bring about life? That maybe the missing body is missing because Jesus is raised from the dead? But why would she think such a thing? Why would anybody? I mean, never mind the fact that Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead, right? Right? Anybody out there? I mean, go back and read the story. Right before this, Jesus just raised Lazarus from the dead, so she should know it's possible that anything is possible with God. Never mind that Jesus has repeatedly said that he will be crucified and on the third day rise. Never mind that the tomb is empty and inside are folded nice and neat at the head and the feet, his grave clothes, or that there's an angelic witness or that Jesus now stands right in front of her, <laughs> speaking with her. But she thinks he's the gardener. I mean, does she not recognize him? Does she not at least recognize his voice? Or have her eyes become so blind and her ears become so deaf and her heart become so hardened that she just can't believe? I mean, all the evidence that anyone would ever need is right there. But maybe it isn't evidence that one needs to believe. It's like the story in John chapter 9. Do you remember the story of Jesus healing the man who was born blind? Anybody? So hard to get Lutherans to engage in a sermon. So if you remember the story of Jesus healing the man who was born blind. Thank you. What more evidence do the townspeople need? The guy says, look, all I know is that I was blind and now I see. Who else could he be but the Son of God? Who else could do this? But it doesn't seem that evidence is the problem. The problem is with us. The townspeople and the Pharisees, they say, well, this must not be that guy. Or, or maybe it was all a hoax to begin with, and maybe uh, he was never blind to start with. <laughs> because they just can't believe. Mary insists that the body must have been taken. No matter how much evidence there is, they just refuse to believe. It's like in John chapter 3. You remember the story of Nicodemus? Yes. Well, a few of you do. The others need to go read your Bibles. But in the story of Nicodemus who comes to Jesus at night, he refuses to see the light. You come to chapter 19 at the end of the story, and he comes with enough burial bomb to keep Jesus dead and buried forever. Now, why would you need all of that if you believe Jesus promised that he was going to rise and live? Mary refuses to believe, despite all the evidence. Thomas, right after that, that we'll hear next week, says that he needs more evidence to believe. He refuses to believe unless he gets to see and to touch. But the problem isn't with the evidence or lack thereof. It's with us. So do you know what Jesus does to address the problem in Mary and in us? It's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer he doesn't give more evidence or further explanations. He doesn't try to make more convincing proofs or apologetics or arguments, trying to appeal to our reason or our rationality as if that would do it. Rather, he resolves the issue relationally with a single word. Having been raised from the dead and having raised Lazarus from the dead. With the tomb open and empty and the grave clothes lying there nice and neat. With angelic witnesses and even Jesus appearing in the flesh talking with her. It isn't until he says a single word, her name. Mary, Thomas, that she and he and we come to believe. It's the only thing that will do it for me and probably for you. Because like me and like Mary, you'll be in bondage to your certainties about life and death and about God until the risen Lord Jesus comes and speaks your name, awaken you to a new reality and raising you to a new life. And sisters and brothers, I'm here to tell you today, 
that he has called you by name in the waters of your baptism. And if you have yet to be baptized, then I invite you to come and be baptized where the Lord Jesus will call you by name and claim you as his own, a sheep of his own fold and a lamb of his own flock and a sinner of his redeeming like the rest of us where he will call and claim you by name, not only in your baptism, but in the day of the resurrection when he will raise you from the dead into eternal life. The Lord Jesus is risen so that Mary, so that you might know that no one can snatch you out of his hand. He is risen victorious over death and the devil and sin and comes to say that this victory is for you that our blind eyes might finally see and our deaf ears might finally listen and our hardened hearts might be broken to pieces and healed that we might trust and live. For this, for you, Christ Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed and any and all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen? Amen. And hallelujah.